Hi folks, I'm Adam, this is the Machine Tech Video Blog, and today I am in a very good mood because it's April. The sun is shining, the weather is warmer, the grass is greener, and most importantly, it's National Auto Collimator Month. To kick off Auto Collimator Month, I'm going to be hanging out in my cold, dark garage to talk about the optics principles behind how auto collimators work. But before I do that, I'd like to briefly discuss what auto collimators are and what they do so that we're all on the same page. This is an auto collimator. It's the simplest one that I own in terms of its design, so it's a good example to illustrate the key elements of auto collimators in general. This is a model D657, D657, made by the Davidson Optronics Company. They've pretty much obsoleted everything in their product line, but back in the day they made some really cool stuff. Now the way that it works is that you shine a light through this port right here. And actually this one is missing its light source, but they're pretty easy to make. You can even use a flashlight. It works just fine. Now if I remove this little housing here, you can see that there is a crosshair right there. Little glass disc with a crosshair on it. This component is called a reticle, by the way. The crosshair is at the focal point of a lens on the other side of this tube. So when you shine a light on the crosshair, like this, the lens will project the image of the crosshair into infinity. By the way, manipulating light in this way is called collimation. All the light rays are parallel to each other and they never come to a focus. So what can we do with this? Well, if we place a mirror in the optical path some distance from the autocollimator, then the image of the crosshair will be reflected off the surface of the mirror and it will re-enter the lens and get refocused at the focal point. This is actually where autocollimators get their name. They are optical instruments, basically telescopes, which are auto or self-collimating. The optical system creates and projects a collimated beam of light and then reflects and refocuses the beam back into itself. But, and here's the big trick right here, in this housing, there is an optical component called a beam splitter. Sometimes people call them two-way mirrors, although that's kind of confusing because people also call them one-way mirrors. In any case, it's an optical device, which is partially transparent and partially reflective. Sometimes they're plates, like this one, but in precision applications they're usually made out of two triangular prisms that are glued together on their hypotenuses to make a cube. But let's not go into that quite yet. The point is that the beam splitter is oriented so that the partially transparent, partially reflective surface is at 45 degrees to the optical path. So it allows light to travel in this direction from the light source, but the return light from the mirror is redirected at 90 degrees and it comes to a focus right about here. So let me go ahead and remove this eyepiece and you can see that right there is another glass disc and this one has a scale on it. Now that scale is at exactly the focal length of the lens, as is the crosshair. And if I reinstall the eyepiece, it magnifies both the image of the scale and the image of the crosshair. So you can see both of them through this eyepiece. Okay, can you see that? Let me wiggle the mirror a little bit, and you can see the crosshair translating across the scale. Now this is actually really, really important. Let me do it in the other direction as well. And you can see that the crosshair can translate in both axes, both X and Y. Okay, so what the heck is happening here and why should you care? When I change the angle of the mirror by rotating it in this direction or by tilting it forward and backward, the image of the crosshair in the eyepiece is displaced. Now the key point here is that a change in the mirror's angle is the only thing that will make the crosshair image change its position in the eyepiece, okay? The distance from the autocollimator does not change the position of the crosshair, nor does a change in vertical displacement or horizontal displacement. Only an angular change. And it's even better than that, because depending on the focal length of the lens, the magnification of the eyepiece, and the resolution of the scale, meaning the spacing between the graduations, you can actually figure out what that angular change is very, very precisely. This method is capable of getting all the way down to a tenth of an arc second resolution. A tenth of an arc second! That is a tiny angle, folks! Let's review some basic circle math. 
A circle is divided into 360 degrees. A degree is further divided into 60 minutes. And a minute is still further divided into 60 seconds. You with me? Now take one second and divide it by 10. That's 0. 0.00028 degrees. That's the resolution that these things are capable of. That's ridiculous! And actually, if you replace the eyepiece with the correct photo sensor, you can get even closer than that. You can get within one one hundredth of an arc second. That's amazing! You should be amazed! Now it turns out that being able to detect very small angular shifts is extremely useful for dimensional metrology applications. Here's one very common application, but it is only one of many applications, okay? So say that you want to check the flatness of a surface like a granite surface plate. You can set the mirror up close to the autocollimator and look at where the reflected image of the crosshair is on the scale in the eyepiece. Then move the mirror along the length of the surface plate, and at regular intervals, look at whether the reflected image of the crosshair has changed its position. If the crosshair image does change its position, then it must be because the mirror is changing its angle in this direction. It's tipping forward or backward, which must mean that there is some error in the form of the surface that the mirror is translating across. Now, based on the shift in angle and the length of the base that the mirror is mounted on, you can calculate the change in vertical height, the flatness error, using simple trigonometry. Whoa! Now come on, that is super useful and I think pretty cool. But okay, what's really going on here? How is this possible? I want to bring this back to basics. Let's play with some toys. I found this sweet little optics discovery kit on eBay for like 30 bucks. What a great way to teach kids or adults about simple geometric optics. It comes with some prisms, some filters and mirrors, uh, some lenses, so these are like two-dimensional lenses, and a laser light source. Much, much fun can be had with this toy, I can tell you. But let me just demonstrate a few optics principles immediately relevant to the world of autocollimators. Okay, let me go ahead and turn this on. So you can see that those three laser beams are all parallel to each other, right? This is mimicking rays of light which are coming from infinity. There's no angle between the light rays, they are parallel, collimated. So imagine that the light is coming from an infinitely far distance, like from a star or something like that. Okay, now let's stick some optical components in the path of the light and see what happens. All right, so I've got a mirror here. Hello, everybody. And if I place this into the path of the light rays, like that, the mirror reflects the light. And that's not super surprising, right? I mean, that's just kind of what a mirror does. But let's notice a couple of things here. The incoming light rays travel in a straight line. And that's how light travels, by the way. It travels in a straight line. The light rays are parallel to each other, and the angle of the reflected rays depends on the angular relationship of the light source and the mirror. When they hit the mirror and are reflected off of the surface, they extend again into infinity. They remain parallel or collimated. Now, that's actually only true if the mirror is perfectly flat. If it has any curvature, uh, if it's convex or concave, then the light rays will diverge or converge, meaning that the light rays will get further away from each other or closer to each other the farther out you go. Okay, so far so good, but reflection is only one way to manipulate light. There is another way. There's also something called refraction. Refraction is when light rays bend as they pass from one transparent medium to another if those media have different densities. In this case, the light rays are traveling from air to plastic and then back to air. But there are lots of other refracting media, for example, glass or water. All of these materials have different indexes of refraction, meaning that they bend light more or less. A device like this one, which manipulates light using refraction, is called a prism. Now, a prism is useful, but it's not as useful as a lens. A lens is also a device which manipulates light using refraction, but it has curved surfaces. So it can not only bend light, it can also combine or disperse it. 
A lens like this one, which has two concave surfaces, is called a diverging lens, because collimated light rays will diverge, or they get further away from each other on the other side of the lens. On the other hand, a lens which has two convex surfaces is called a converging lens, for, I think, obvious reasons. Now, that spot right there, where all of the light rays converge, is called the focal point of the lens. And this distance from the lens to the focal point is called the focal length. Okay, I hope you're still with me, because now we basically have everything that we need to construct a model of an autocollimator. Let's say that we reverse this setup, okay? What if, instead of taking collimated light from an infinitely far source and then focusing it, we take light from a point source, that is one which radiates light in all directions from a single point, and then place it at the focal point of the lens and collimate it? We can run this same system in reverse. I'm going to leave just one of these lasers on. And you can see that because the light ray is right on center of the lens, the lens really doesn't refract the light very much. But if I change the position where the light hits the lens, then I can bend it. Okay, now if I change the angle of the light, and I change where it hits the lens, then I can straighten out that beam. And if that beam originates at exactly the focal point of this lens, then the ray will be truly collimated. So it's relatively easy to tell when the light source is at the focal point of the lens, because if you translate the lens along the optical path like this, as soon as the light rays are collimated on this side of the lens, then the light source must be at the focal point. Now, of course, here we're only tracing a single light ray, but you'll have to imagine that there are many others just like it, radiating out from that single point, and all of them are being manipulated in the same way. They're all being collimated. This is a very, very important concept. Now I'm going to put the mirror back in there. And actually, you know, this is probably going to be kind of difficult to see, so let me turn off the lights and see if that helps. Okay, that's much better. Now look at how the light ray reflects off of the mirror, re-enters the lens, and then gets refocused back over here on this side of the lens. Notice that it doesn't return exactly to the same point. Now if we were tracing a bunch more light rays, you could see that the return light rays do focus back down onto the same plane, the same focal plane. But the focal point of the return light rays has shifted down a little. And if I rotate the mirror, you can see that the light hits a different part of the lens, and the return light ray focuses in a different spot over on the left. This is the same thing that's happening in an autocollimator. Now imagine that the light source is the crosshair, and the point where the return light rays focus is the position of the crosshair image in the eyepiece. Okay, now I know you're thinking, well, of course the angle of the mirror changes the angle of reflection, and that will change the point where the light ray hits the focal plane. But surely translation along the optical axis must also have an effect. Or what about translation perpendicular to the optical axis? Surely that must have an effect, right? Well, my inquisitive imaginary interlocutor, let's find out. So I've got the mirror taped to this angle block, and the first thing that I'm going to do is test to see whether translation across the optical axis, perpendicular to the optical axis, has an effect. So I'm going to move the angle block in the mirror along this parallel straight edge. The angle of the mirror is going to stay the same, but we'll see if that has any effect on the ultimate position of the return light ray on the focal plane. Also, I changed the angle of the camera a little bit so that you could see the return ray a little bit better. Here we go, moving the mirror. And there's no real change. No real change, okay? And, and that shouldn't be surprising to you. This is pretty intuitive because all you're doing is hitting a different part of the mirror. But as long as the mirror is flat, then whichever part of it you hit kind of doesn't matter. Okay, now I've got the straight edge set up the opposite way. So I'm going to be translating the mirror along the optical axis, and let's see what happens. Okay, here we go. Look at that! Look at that! How cool is that? There is virtually no change 
in the position of the return light ray. Now, what I'd like you to notice is that as I move the mirror, the return light ray hits a different part of the lens. But, because of the curvature of the lens, as the point where the return light ray hits the lens gets further away from the center and closer to the edge, the light is refracted or bent more. So the end result is that the point where the light ray hits the focal plane remains the same. That is freaking awesome! And it's a great demonstration of this very important optics principle. Although I do have to point out that how well the light ray refocuses on that point is dependent on the precision of the profile of the lens. But in principle, the only thing, the only thing that changes the focal point of the return light ray is the angle of the mirror. That is the only thing that matters here. Woo! Are you still with me? I certainly hope so. I recognize that that was a lot of information to throw at you just now, but hopefully I presented it in a clear enough manner and you've gained some insight and intuition into the basics of how autocollimators work. I'm going to end this video here because I think that's plenty of information for one video, but in future follow-up videos coming out very, very soon, I'm going to talk about some other topics related to autocollimators, like taking a close look at the components which make up an autocollimator, examining several common autocollimator designs, I've got a few of them, uh, doing the math to figure out what the resolution of an autocollimator is, and hey, who knows, maybe we'll even make one ourselves. <laughs> but for now, that's it from the Machine Tech video blog. I hope that you found that entertaining and I hope you learned something.